Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the latest webinar in the BioExcel webinar series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Gromax and the latest release. So the title of the talk is Gromax 2018 Overview of the New Features and Capabilities. Um, my name is Adam Carter. I'm one of the members of the BioExcel project. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to very quickly say a few things about BioExcel and then I'll hand over to our main speaker today, Mark Abraham, who will um, produce the rest of today's webinar. Just a quick uh, note to let you know that this webinar is being recorded along with the question and answer session at the end. Um, so you should be aware of that. And it also means that you'll be able to catch up with it again later on YouTube and the BioExcel website. And we post it there after the webinar. So I've got one slide here to give a sort of very high level overview of what the BioExcel Center of Excellence is all about. There's kind of three main strands to what we're trying to do. Uh, one thing is um, excellence in biomolecular software. So we have three important um, biomolecular codes that we support in this project. We're trying to improve the performance and efficiency and the scalability of these codes. We have um, uh, Gromax for molecular dynamic simulations. That you'll obviously hear more about today. And we'll have Haddock for docking, and we also are involved with CPMD for QMMM calculations. Uh, the second kind of strand of the project is on usability. So the idea is that uh, it's all very well having powerful, uh, uh, powerful and scalable programs, but it's also these one these programs also need to be usable. So we have various different strands of the project that are looking into how to make biomolecular research software uh, easier to use. And one of the key approaches that we're doing here is to integrate these into workflow environments, uh, along with some data integration aspects as, as well. Um, so that is another important aspect of what we're looking at. And the final part is the fact that uh, we are, uh, we really are aiming to be user driven in what we try to do. So um, we say here excellence in consultancy and training, that basically just means that we want to be the place that people come to when they want to find out about all things related to biomolecular computation, um, particularly at scale. Uh, so what we intend to do is to promote best practices and train end users. So one of the ways that we, we do this is by supporting this webinar series. Uh, another thing that we do is that we run interest groups in various different areas. So um, if any of the interest groups on these slides look like they may be of interest to you, you should visit the BioExcel website and from there you can see how you can join uh, all of these interest groups. Just uh, a slide to let you know that um, we will probably be saving the most of the questions until the end of today's webinar. It just makes it uh, run a bit more smoothly, um, but you're able to type in your question at any time. So uh, this a question box uh, on your normal GoToWebinar control panel, it will look something like this, maybe a little bit different if you're not a, well, not a host, um, but there'll be a question box there and you can type your question. At the end, um, uh, I will uh, invite you to ask your question to the speaker directly if you have a microphone. Uh, if you don't, then I can read out the question to, to Mark and he can answer it um, in that way. So uh, I'll remind you about that at the end, uh, but you can ask a question at any time by typing it into this box here. And if you're watching uh, the recording of this later on YouTube um, and you have questions about the webinar, the best place to ask them is on the BioExcel forum at ask.bioexcel.eu. Um, if you post your question there, we will do our best to, to answer it as quickly um, as we can. Okay, so today's speaker then is um, Mark Abraham. He's from the KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. And he is the development manager of Gromax, which, as you're probably aware, is one of the world's most widely used HPC applications. So his role there um, is twofold. Uh, he's the, uh, as a core developer, as well as being the development manager. And within the team, he focuses on modernizing the, the code base uh, to be a sound platform for fast, flexible, and free molecular simulations in a rapidly changing world. So I think the fact that things are always changing is quite quite important to the work that BioExcel is, is supporting um, with these with these codes. Um, so Mark's in charge of the, the strategic plan, the release management, and he also coordinates the, the global team of developers from his base in Stockholm. 
And so Mark is an ideal person to tell us about what uh, what is new with the new release of Gromax. So uh, at this point, I will hand over the presentation to Mark. Mark, I'm about to make you uh, the presenter. Um, and then you can take over from, from here. So there you go, Mark. Right, we can see your slides, but we can't hear you yet, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Adam, yes. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I am uh, Mark Abraham, who's uh, one of the, the core developers uh, for, of Gromax here. And our topic for the day, as you uh, all will know, is, is uh, providing you an overview of the, the new functionality and capability that we have in the, the latest release of, of Gromax. Uh, that's been out now for, for two months, um, and so we're already starting to get some feedback from users um, about the things that, that they like about it and the things that, that we can improve further in future. Um, so we, we're very keen to, to hear from you in, in future about the kinds of things that you, you like about what we have done and what you would like us to do in future um, for, for later releases of Gromac. So a quick overview of, of Gromax capabilities for some of you who, who may not be um, regular users of Gromax yourselves. Um, Gromax implements um, molecular dynamic simulations of biomolecular systems. Uh, so that involves us setting up an, a description of typically a, a, a biochemistry system in, in atomistic detail. We, any, every individual carbon or hydrogen or oxygen atom, for example, um, gets assigned a, a, a position um, and it has a mass and it interacts with the other atoms, perhaps by a charge-charge interaction, maybe it has bonds, um, all these kinds of uh, physical interactions with all the other atoms in the system model what happens in, in the real uh, physical environment that uh, is, is the, the, the object of the scientific study. In this particular example, we're looking at a glick ion channel. Uh, which forms part of the signaling, it's a model actually, of the, the signaling um, behavior that takes place in all of our nerve cells. The, the ion channel has a key role in permitting ions to go from one side of the cell membrane in teal uh, to the other, um, only when the overall function of the nerve cell actually dictates that that's a good idea. And there's lots of interesting mechanistic details that we'd like to be able to study here, but it's very difficult to do in the laboratory. Um, so that this motivates doing simulations with Gromax, um, because we were able to give to the scientists fine control about how to set up the initial conditions, how to add maybe a drug that might modify the behavior of these ion channels, maybe there's an antibody that binds to it to change its behavior. All these sorts of things can be studied in a simulation, sometimes more easily than in an experiment, um, and oftentimes more quickly and less expensively too. So, uh, just a quick word about how we manage um, the releases of Gromax. We aim to deliver one release um, per calendar year. Um, so as I said uh, a moment ago, we've got the, the first release of Gromax out in January this year. Uh, just last week, in fact, we brought out the first patch release that identifies a few minor issues that um, several of the developers and indeed many of the users um, brought to our attention. So thanks very much for that feedback. We're, we're very keen to, to listen to uh, your experiences and to, to try and make life um, better for uh, us all. Uh, so we will continue maintaining that release for um, the remainder of this year. We'll, we'll address any and all issues that, that come up. Um, we have another older branch that's still under active maintenance. That was the one we released uh, in Gromax 20, 2016. Uh, so even though it's 2018, we'll continue to, to make releases from it. We'll increment the .x at the end to, to illustrate that what we're doing is only making um, the fixes that come to our attention that affect scientific correctness, for, for want of a better word. If, if MD runs doing an inappropriate simulation or analysis tool has, has producing some, some not quite right numbers, these sort of things we will fix, but we won't make any other changes. So the hope is that by the end of um, a lifetime, there's no known correctness bugs in 2016. Unfortunately, that means there's a lot of older branches of Gromax that aren't being actively maintained anymore. So those of you who might be using Gromax 3.x or 4.x or 5.x um, are strongly encouraged to, to update to more recent versions of Gromax, both because unfortunately those older uh, implementations had issues that have, have been discovered. Unfortunately, many of the techniques that we're implementing here are themselves research topics and how best to implement them is also an open question. So we get things wrong from time to time. Um, and the best way for you to um, get the 
best from the new hardware that you likely have available, um, and also to take advantage of all the th changes that we've made to the behavior to make it better, um, is to stay up to date. So our, our new numbering where we have the year of the release as the major version number um, will hopefully keep people better in touch with how uh, the progress of the code has, has gone on. Really, if you're using a piece of code that's more than five years old, um, it's very likely that uh, you should strongly consider uh, using a more recent version. So we plan to release the Gremix 2019 version um, very early in the new year. Um, so if you're a, a community member with a, perhaps a modified version of Gromax or a feature you'd like to contribute, we're going to need to hear from you uh, maybe by uh, August or September. Um, and definitely we'd love to have code uh, up and uh, able to be reviewed by the core developers by the start of September. Um, but preferably get in touch with us long before then, because often these things need careful consideration, design, and, and negotiation in order that we can deliver code on time that works well that everybody wants to use. So, in Gromax 2018, uh, we have a number of interesting new simulation features. Um, the, one of the high impact one of those is the implementation of the adaptive weight histogram method. I'm not going to talk in, in detail about that one here today. We might give a future uh, webinar on that. Um, because it's a, it's a very interesting implementation of, um, you could think of it as a fancy form of umbrella sampling that, that permits um, a, a free energy calculation to very efficiently sample many different um, reaction, uh, many different parts of a reaction coordinate, somewhat also like metadynamics. Um, so we're, we're hoping that people will, will find that one particularly useful, um, but please do give us feedback as always. Um, some of our colleagues in the US, Pascal Mertz and Michael Schertz, um, have done some very interesting work implementing physical validation tests. I'll speak a little bit more about these later in the, the webinar. Uh, but basically these provide another layer of confidence that the community can have that an individual researcher's science has been done well, as well as the code that they use to do it um, has been implemented correctly. So this, this adds another layer to the overall impression of quality um, that we can have uh, about the, the molecular dynamic suites, uh, molecular dynamic simulations that have been done with these software suites. Berk Hess of the, the core team here at KTH uh, has also improved the way that some of the integrators are able to report a conserved quantity. Uh, various of the coupling algorithms do physical work upon the system, um, and that work has an amount of energy associated with it, um, which we can accumulate over the lifetime of the simulation so that we can have a conserved quantity, not just in um, an NVE ensemble, um, but also if we have temperature or pressure coupling. Uh, several of the integrators already reported these, and Burke's expanded those to include the um, Berenson and pressure and temperature coupling algorithms, and also the uh, uh, paranello run pressure coupling algorithm. Um, so hopefully that will uh, allow people to run very simple tests um, themselves to observe that conserved quantities are in fact conserved as well as they would like, um, but we strongly encourage people to also consider the more rigorous kinds of tests that Pascal and Michael um, have implemented. More about that in a moment. Uh, as Adam uh, foreshadowed in his in introduction, we also uh, are working very hard on trying to make these quite complicated pieces of software more usable. Uh, we have been greatly expanding the, the documentation. Um, Paul Bauer in particular with uh, Vedran Militech uh, has been working uh, quite hard on those. There's lots more uh, developments in the pipeline for that, um, including a revamp of the Gromax website. So we should have very, very good things there um, for Gromax 2019. So please watch this space. One piece of feedback we had from users um, via our, our fora um, was that it was sometimes difficult to understand how to specify where atoms were restrained in space by position restraints. Um, our pre-processing a tool Gromp or Gromp PP, depending which school you, you belong to, um, would always take the coordinates from the, the file you'd pass with minus C, um, and optionally you could do that with minus R. And people didn't understand very well that this option existed, so we made that um, required. So it's very easy for you to just give the same file again, um, if that's in fact the behavior that you want to have. Uh, but overall, this, this I think, uh, will, will be more usable to everybody so that they understand, yes, I've I've said restrain the positions to this coordinate um, so that when you're extending a simulation, it's very clear to you um, that you can pass to Grump this minus R to get the right the positions you actually want. We also made some minor improvements to some of the helpful messages that, that Grump uh, sometimes gives, including the one on uh, checking the total charge uh, of a simulation system. 
Um, there, there were sometimes some rounding issues associated with reporting that, and we improved. Uh, Tim Romero, one of our long-time contributors, um, also uh, added support for dynamic selections into uh, the GMX trajectory tool that allows you to take your trajectory file uh, and get ASCII coordinates from that. Um, and he added support for you to use a dynamic selection for that. So you could say, I would like all the atoms within two nanometers of this particular group or this particular atom, um, and you can get a text file out with, with all of that. Our hope is that we'll be able to put more time uh, in this year to porting more of the analysis tools to have this kind of functionality, um, which will be uh, an exciting uh, way to have highly usable analysis tools uh, in the future. BioXL has been great for supporting us there. We've also got a number of performance enhancements, which I'll um, spend the majority of the time talking through um, so that people understand best how to take advantage of these. Um, they include porting the long range part of the PME algorithm to run on GPUs, which is a, an exciting new development. Um, however, there's been numerous um, both algorithmic and implementation improvements um, on more traditional, um, well, not, some more, not, not more traditional, these, these have always been there. Um, Construction or the management of the pair lists that are necessary. I'll talk more about those shortly. Um, Black Hess is also, um, with, supported by several others of us here, um, added more support for running on the CPU uh, using the SIMD capabilities of, of modern hardware to, to their greatest capacity um, to make sure that in the traditionally less time consuming part of the MD simulations, which is where we've got the forces and we have to calculate updates to the velocities and then the positions. Um, traditionally, this didn't take any time, so no one bothered making them run fast. However, we've done so much good work on all of the other uh, force calculation parts that we now need to make sure that the update and some of the bonded kernels uh, are also uh, doing the, the, the getting the best possible performance. Uh, so we're working uh, at multiple parts of the code to make things good. So just a brief reminder for um, those of you um, you haven't perhaps reflected on the, the, the implementation details of the molecular system uh, as much as some others. The critical part for all of these kinds of molecular dynamics packages um, is to calculate the non-bonded interactions. Here we're just considering the short-ranged ones where we have a single atom that we're currently considering and we want to make sure that we consider all of the through space interactions um, with all of the neighbors within it a characteristic interaction radius. So we might have different radii for the Coulomb interactions or the Van der Waals interactions. Sometimes they're going to be the same. Um, that's really up to developers of the force fields. Uh, Gromax will uh, implement uh, all of the common flavors of, of force field uh, designs that people have implemented. It's one of the, the attractive features about doing simulations in Gromax is that we support all of the, the, the modern range of force fields. Um, however, the construction of uh, the, the overall simulation is quite inefficient if at every time step you compare all of these uh, particles distance from the particle whose, whose forces you want to compute at each time step. What we'd rather do is make a list of all the particles that are close enough um, and to only uh, go through that list, calculating interaction for all the atoms on that list. Uh, however, the computation of that list tends to be fairly time consuming. So we'd like to do it once and then reuse it a lot of times. However, we are doing a dynamical simulation, so sometimes particles move in and out of that list. So we actually need to make the list rather larger than the interaction radius so that we can be statistically confident that over the lifetime of that list, any particle out here hasn't gotten in there, um, or vice versa, any particle that wasn't here hasn't got all the way out of there, um, so that we were calculating them, them inappropriately. Now, in Gromax, ever since version 4.6, our, our Vole scheme, which is now the, the default, um, since Gromax 5.1, um, groups together the particles for computational efficiency. So in fact, we don't consider the particle the unit of computation, but rather a group of particles. Here, for the illustration, we've chosen four, but depending on the, the implementation um, piece of hardware that you're, you're running on, this could be four or eight. Um, so we still do the actual physical computation in terms of the individual atoms. But what we do is group them together so that rather, rather than look, look, about the, look at the interaction of this atom with that atom, we look at this cluster of four atoms with that cluster of four. We still don't have this atom interact with any of these central ones because it's outside the interaction radius. Um, but this gives us a uh, version of the algorithm that's much easier to implement faster. We do have to do a little bit extra work in computing numbers that turn out to be ones that we need to throw away. 
Um, but overall, the, the efficiency improvements are much, much higher from expressing the problem in this way. Physically, it's exactly the same, um, but the implementation is much better if we cast it this way. What this does is mean that out here, when we're considering constructing the neighbor list, we often have many um, uh, of these clusters that have only a couple of their atoms within the radius. So we even have some effective additional buffering outside this list, um, which uh, is also valuable because that means that even though we say our interaction list is, is this wide, actually it's effectively a little bit wider. Um, so that's, that's a subtle thing to, to pay attention to um, in how things work. Um, so more about this and none. Um, we will come back to some of the improvements we've done and how, to, how we set up the, managing these lists behind the scenes. Um, quick reminder of the, the set of different sorts of work we have to do inside Chromax um, that we spend a lot of time making work faster and faster so that you can have your scientific solutions uh, sooner and can, can sample more widely so that you have greater scientific validity. A major part of the work historically has been um, the computation of these short-range interactions. They then have to get um, reduced um, with other contributions that might exist. Um, in this case, we're only looking at a computation on a, on a single um, CPU, even if it's running on multiple CPU cores, whether they are MPI, OpenMP, doesn't really matter. The work is roughly the same. Once we've got the short range work done, we move on to the bonded interactions. So these are all your, your angles and your dihedrals typically. Accumulate those to the force buffers. Then we go and do the various components of the work that go into the long range part of the PME algorithm. Uh, this is the, the de facto standard for treating the, the electrostatics uh, within these biomolecular systems. Um, and having got all of those components of the force computed, we reduce them all together so that we have for each atom the total force that it should experience. We then use that force to um, go through the update phase, perhaps using virtual sites if, if you're using a model that, that implements those. Use those forces to uh, go into to Newton's law um, to determine the acceleration so we know how to update the velocities of the atoms. Use the updated velocities uh, to update the positions, perhaps having temperature or pressure coupling uh, implemented in the meantime. And then we loop back to calculate the forces from the, the new positions. So this is the fundamental algorithm that everybody's um, microdynamics implementation does. Different ways, different algorithms, different flavors, um, but fundamentally everyone's doing this kind of operation. Uh, ever since Chromax 4.6, we've had available uh, the ability to offload the short range or particle particle uh, interactions to a GPU. Uh, and that has given us a dramatic ability to, to improve performance because not only are we able to do some work on the CPU, we're able to do work on the GPU in parallel with that. Um, so, this concurrent execution means that the overall length of time illustrated in this flowchart is now much shorter because we're using more, more hardware. This does, however, mean that the execution flow of code now has two different paths, which means it's more complicated for us to implement and sometimes a little bit harder to use. We're working hard on making that better, um, but those improvements will have to wait uh, until at least Chromex 2019. Um, but the good part here is that we're able to use the separate CPU and, and GPU uh, resources separately. So many of you will be familiar with this workflow. Uh, we've had it available for, for quite a few years now. One of the critical new pieces of functionality we've introduced in Chromax this year is the ability also to offload the long ranged part of the PME algorithm uh, to run on a GPU. Uh, so this will only run on a single uh, GPU for the PME component at this, at this time, where we may improve that in future, depending on how we prioritize when, when we've got some experimental implementations done. Um, so this too uh, allows us to either offload both the particle particle and the long range work to the same GPU or potentially to different GPUs. Uh, there is a possibility to use multiple GPUs if you would use domain decomposition in um, the short, for the short range directions on multiple ranks and a separate PME rank that's targeting just one GPU uh, for the, the long range component. So there's quite a bit of flexibility in how you can use uh, the code there. Um, we hope to improve that in the future. Meanwhile, the CPU is only doing um, the small amount of work that is typically associated with the bonded interactions, uh, some of which got those recent SIMD improvements, and perhaps any extra work that might be going on if you're using uh, umbrella sampling or doing a free energy calculation. We have some other workload that goes in here. Uh, so one of the big advantages of introducing PME on GPUs is that uh, we need much less CPU resource. And so that can be 
are much more cost effective uh, for Gromax users to be able to procure hardware now. Uh, you need many much less powerful CPU resource for equivalently powerful GPU resource. Of course, we get all the forces together again, which is, is just a matter of doing the accounting correctly uh, and going to the updates phase as before. Um, so moving back to these pair interactions, what we've done uh, here through some, some very elegant algorithmic uh, and implementation work by Silan Paul and, and um, Berk Hess um, is to have not only uh, the inner list that works roughly the same before, but we actually have a counter list outside that, which has a much longer lifetime than we were able to have by default in earlier versions of Chromax. And what we do is to run very quick computation periodically during, during the simulation, every couple of steps, to find out which of these clusters has gone inside the inner radius. And so we update the inner pair list, which is the one we actually compute all the forces on. What this does is give us the ability to have an, an effectively much longer neighbor list lifetime, uh, which is great because we spend fewer CPU cycles computing those while we're, we've got our expensive GPUs sitting idle. Um, and remove from the user the need to tune this parameter for optimal performance. Uh, we can take care of that internally now, uh, which will improve the usability of maximal performance in Gromax, which is one of our, our key long-term objectives. We would love for people to be able to just run GMX MD1 and MD1 itself will work out how to run best um, on the hardware that you have available. That's a big ask, however, so we're doing it in stages. Um, so this is an illustration of some of the workflow there. We have now um, some extra kernels that run to take the outer pair list, produce the inner pair list, which then gets computed on the, uh, during the, the non-modded forces. While the update is going on, particularly if we're on GPUs, we're able to run some kernels and what was otherwise wasted time to do this pruning of the pair lists so that we can find out um, whether any particles have gone inside that inner list um, over the recent update stages. Um, so this is a quite elegant way of using otherwise uh, unused compute time um, to overall boost performance and efficiency quite substantially. Uh, this is illustrated here, um, comparing um, the dynamic pruning setups running on GPUs with um, the old style approach where one would have a fixed pair switch frequency that you would set up. Uh, so running, on, running a, a moderately sized system uh, on 56 MPA links, um, performance would reach a peak at sort of 15 to 20, where we're trading off the cost of having a much larger list that you need to have with a longer pair list lifetime, because you need to account for much greater potential for, for particles diffusing. Um, the overall efficiency would start to go down. However, with this dual pair list set up with the uh, dynamic pruning uh, implementation, not only do we have a much more even set of performance across a wider range of, of pair searches, but we can do pair switch much less often too. So that's that's a, a, a very elegant dual win. Uh, so Sillard, Burke, uh, Sillard, has some, uh, Sillard, Paul, and Burke Hess did the primary work there. Um, in couple, coupled with the PME on GPU implementation, whose uh, chief architect was um, Alexey Yupanov, um, ably supported, of course, by Sillard, Sillard, Paul, and the rest of the development team here, including Burke and I. Um, so here we have some... Uh, of the press Gromax 2018 performance numbers. Uh, so what we have here are comparisons between two different uh, simulation setups comparing strengths of GPUs on reasonably modern um, CPU implement uh, CPU hardware on the iron channel in, in that introductory slide that I showed earlier. So this is a, a quite characteristic uh, simulation size that a biomolecular simulator might uh, use. What we have here is a plot of the number of simulation cores on the CPU uh, that were used to get simulation throughput um, in simulation nanoseconds per day. We can see here that the, um, so we're just looking at the Gromax 2018 capabilities now. So that's including improvements to SIMD update and angles and the rolling pruning and all those sort of nice things. Um, what we can see here is that we add cores to the version where the PME calculation runs on the CPU, performance gets steadily better. Um, so that's nice. Um, here we're using a GTX 1080, uh, which is one of the, the more powerful consumer grade GPUs that are currently on the market. Um, however, if we use the same GPU setup and instead send the PME work to the GPU using the new feature available within Gromax, 
we get an immediate performance boost that's quite dramatic um, and also reaches peak performance with rather fewer number of cores. And so this was one of our key um, development targets uh, for, for future resources to need fewer CPU cores um, for equivalent throughput performance. Already we can see here, just by turning on the PME and GPUs, you could almost get away with having, instead of 16 cores, well, you could you definitely get away with having eight cores, but even four would give you um, very effective um, cost-benefit performance uh, available there. If you move to more powerful GPU, um, that effect is even more pronounced. Here in blue, we have the, the CPU-only version of, of PME, and if we move to um, the GPU version of PME, Again, we see a, a dramatic performance benefit compared to the blue line from the red line. And that too, not only has a higher peak because we're doing more work on a more powerful GPU this time, um, but yeah, the, the fraction of achievable peak of that GPU you can get for relatively few CPU cores has, has changed in a very favorable way too. Looking over time, uh, we can see that our, our CPU implementation has continued to improve through Lots and lots of small improvements over time. Um, we, are, ever since Chrome X5, have been delivering steady small improvements there. Um, however, the capabilities of the, the newer hardware on the, the GPUs particularly, um, and our implementations on those, um, have um, given us more dramatic improvements um, in, in recent times. Um, so we can see that when we're using both a CPU and a GPU, we've had a similar but more dramatic trend um, to, to higher performance over time as we go from Gramax 5 to 5.1 to 2016 to 2018 over a period of about four years. However, if we go to Gramax 2018 and move the PME calculation to GPUs, we get a dramatic benefit. So this was, um, from our point of view, well worth our effort, um, and we're going to be working hard in future to add more feature parity to the, the PME on GPU implementation, um, support a wider range of and setups um, and port even more of the computation uh, to the GPUs, but also in a way that keeps all the benefits available to the CPU that we can. Uh, we're working very actively to make sure that we, we do have a fast CPU uh, performance, not only on um, the high performance cores from Intel, but also on those from AMD and indeed upcoming ones from ARM. We're very keen to make sure that we continue to have strong performance portability across all the hardware because we literally do not know what hardware we'll be running on in five years' time. So we want to make sure that your effort in learning how to use Gromax and run well with it um, will continue to be available no matter what kind of computer hardware you'll have available in the future. Um, we're already doing a lot of work to, to make sure that your effort in learning and using Gromax uh, isn't going to be wasted anytime soon. So moving to a quite different topic, some of the other exciting features we have in, in Gromax 2018, uh, is the introduction of a physical validation testing suite. Um, Pascal Mertz and uh, Michael Schwetz have done a lot of work uh, on this. Um, see, what I'm illustrating here is actually from some earlier work from, from Michael Schwetz, um, illustrating that if we run, run two different simulations at neighboring temperatures, maybe a couple of degrees apart, we might expect to see quite different distributions of the potential energy. Uh, these follow are uh, not quite um, Gaussian distribution, of course, um, because we have a limited number of degrees of freedom. Um, but we expect uh, a degree of overlap if we've chosen our temperature difference um, suitably, such that the probability distributions for the energy of the system uh, overlap in a, in a given way. Now, this particular plot doesn't tell you anything because you really couldn't tell if the simulation was doing something inappropriate, the shape of this would be subtly off. But it's very difficult to tell, for example, whether this dot, dotted line or the dashed line um, is, a, is a faithful representation of each other. However, when we run two simulations at control parameters that are slightly different from each other, we can now take those histograms that we can form from these probability distributions, uh, take their ratio and plot those on a log linear plot and see whether the, the, um, the log linear plot um, is A linear and B has a slope that is characteristic of the temperature difference in this case. Um, this turns out to be a very valuable test of quality um, about whether the simulation algorithm is in, in fact sampling um, what you in your MDP file or, or indeed any other M, uh, MD packages inputs uh, have actually asked for. So this is another old result from, from a paper from Michael from a few years ago illustrating that on the left the Berenson style weak coupling um, temperature coupling algorithm 
produces a, a distribution that's roughly linear, but has a slope that is very much different from what you would expect for the two temperatures that we chose for these this pair of simulations. However, for example, the um, Nose Hula uh, temperature coupling scheme within Gromax has not only the, the expected linear trend when you've done enough sampling, um, but also has the correct slope. So we can have much higher confidence that the Minosa Hoover implementation um, is implemented correctly in Gromax for this particular simulation system um, than the, the Berenson weak coupling implementation. This, of course, reinforces the, the well-known behavior um, that the kinetic energy distribution produced by um, the Berenson algorithm uh, is rather different from uh, that which you would expect uh, or a properly sampled canonical distribution. Um, so it's good to see that the wrong kinetic energy distribution that is produced by that leaks into the potential energy distribution, which goes into the uh, the inputs here. So equipotation is, is working as expected um, when we get a wrong distribution of potential energy, not because we're computing the energies wrong, but because we're getting the kinetic energy distribution wrong. So these kinds of subtle issues are one of the things that keep the developers of many packages up at night, trying to make sure that none of these sort of errors creep in. So there are many other kinds of um, physical validation tests that they have incorporated. Uh, the kinetic energy distributions are another one that um, are able to be studied because we know in advance um, that those should follow a maximum Boltzmann distribution. And there are well-known statistical tests that allow us to identify whether or not um, the distribution of, of velocities that we in fact observe for any sub, sub part of the system um, it, are being correctly sampled. Um, so, there will be interesting work, I'm sure, in future, finding any corner, um, corners of Gromax that, in particular, combinations of algorithms haven't been fully planned through, potentially. And indeed, testing all of the other MD packages out there in the field. Our, our hope is very much that um, you as users will be able to have in your hands a test suite that rather than write in your paper, hi, here's my MDP settings, I used this combination, and relying on you and your colleagues and perhaps the peer reviewer uh, to catch any errors in this, uh, but we can in fact have an automated suite that says, yes, your integration set up with all of your different um, choices of parameters, in fact, it does produce uh, a sampling scheme that passes all of these, these validation tests automatically so that we can move to um, having uh, these tools available in, in your hands um, rather than relying on expert know-how of uh, relatively small number of researchers around the world. This is already implemented in Gromax 2018. You can use it to, to verify um, several interesting properties um, like um, the, the aforementioned ones and also, for example, the fluctuations of the potential energy. Um, those two should scale with the size of the simulation time step. Um, so this gives you a way to have confidence in the quality of the, imp in quality of the implementation of the integrator um, if we can show that, in fact, yes, the fluctuations in the potential energy do scale uh, with the size of the time step in the expected quadratic way. Um, this is a very good um, check for us. Um, so we will now be um, doing all of our future releases of Gromax uh, to make sure that we pass both the current and future states uh, of this physical validation test so that you can have confidence that what you get um, in the simulation package is what it says on the box. So that brings us to the end of the formal uh, material that, that I have prepared. Um, Adam uh, will now lead the audience Q&A session. Uh, are you there, Adam? Have I yes, still got you? Yes, indeed, Mark. That was a nice overview of everything that's new. Um, so thank you very much for that. So as Mark said, we're now open to taking questions from the floor. Uh, so if you do have a question, um, it would be great if you could type it into the, the question box now. Uh, I can see we already have some questions there, so uh, I'm going to make a start on those. And um, if anyone else has a question, they can, can type it in as we go along. So um, in the first case, we have a question from uh, Hovakim. Um, Hovakim, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open your mic in a moment. Uh, if you have a microphone, you can ask your question directly. Uh, if you don't want to do so, you can just remain silent or uh, uh, and I can uh, read out the question on your behalf. Um, so uh, having said that, uh, I now cannot find your name in the list of attendees. So let me read out the question and just in case you've uh, dropped off and you can always hear the, the answer in the recording later on. So the question that Hovakim asked was, 
Um, what do you think about the recent Ryzen CPU for Gromax simulation? Any tips to optimize systems under Ryzen? Thanks for the question. Um, we've certainly been actively following the, the developments um, on AMD's front, where we're very keen on having um, a competitive uh, hardware environment for um, the different vendors to, to sell into, and we're very keen to make sure that Gromax runs optimally um, on all of these pieces of hardware. So we have done uh, considerable effort to make sure that our SIM, CPU side SIMD usage uh, is, is well suited for running on Ryzen. So we absolutely encourage people um, to consider both the, the latest Intel and AMD CPUs uh, or uh, their, their Gromax simulations. There's not really a, a good sense of how to optimize systems under Ryzen. It's, it's essentially the same. Um, one tip for the unwary is that those of you who've used older AMD CPUs may have gotten used to the concept that there's one hardware thread per core. Uh, the Zen architecture has two hardware threads per core. So that's, that's like the, the Intel CPUs uh, have been for quite a long time. Um, so in a sense, that got a bit easier. It's just different if you're used to AMD uh, only. Um, but really, yeah, we strongly encourage people um, to, to go and, and buy Ryzen. You probably need a, a couple more Ryzen cores for um, the same performance you would get for Intel's um, high-end cores, but any kind of simul uh, any kind of direct numerical comparison is is quite tricky here. Uh, you have to consider issues of total cost and power and all, all these kinds of things. So yeah, absolutely, go and use AMD's new new CPUs. They're great. Uh, Gromax will run great on them. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, so I hope that answered the question. Uh, the next question was, um, I'm not entirely sure I completely understand this question, but I'm going to ask it as it is, uh, uh, Mark, and then maybe you can, you can clarify if, if you need to. So the question was, what would you recommend to optimize a system of 60,000 atoms under Ryzen uh, and GTX 1070? So I guess, um, I guess that's... Uh, Given that hardware, what, uh, what's the best way to set up your, your simulation? So 60,000 well, yeah, atoms under Ryzen. There's two ways to interpret that. Sort of how many how many CPU cores would you want to buy in your in in the socket to to pair um, for that? Um, and indeed, once you've got that, how would you run this run the simulation? Um, that too is a is a question that unfortunately doesn't have an easy answer. This is one of the reasons why we want to doing better, uh, do a better job in future of allowing MD1 to try a couple of different setups um, and have this run um, automatically so that uh, this, this sort of question um, doesn't arise. Um, the first part is, is reasonably straightforward. I would definitely want at least eight cores to go with that relatively powerful um, 1070. It's certainly not as, as powerful as the 1080 or, the, or definitely the 1080 Ti. Um, but yeah, you will, you will not be able to use a simple four core desktop style CPU. You definitely want to go for um, a, a server grade uh, socket there. Um, and indeed, if you would want multiple GPUs, you definitely need multi-socket uh, Ryzen as well. Um, as far as running goes, it's basically the same as, as running under Intel um, or um, the, the historical versions of Gromax. Um, you probably want to use um, the additional hardware thread that's available for uh, with OpenMP. Um, that's likely to be good. Um, you can get performance benefits by running multiple MPI ranks sharing the same GPU. That's that's still a valid use case for both Verizon and for, for Intel. Um, yeah. All the standard considerations apply, really. There's, there's nothing special about Ryzen. Yeah. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, so the next question I have, and I don't have a name against this one either for some reason, uh, it's how to activate PME on GPU. So uh, is there anything special to know about activating PME when you're using GPU? So um, this is a difficult question because um, well, sorry, it's a difficult question for us to make the assignment work easily because we don't have a good way of telling in advance 
how efficiently your simulation will run on your CPU and your GPU. It's it's a, a big complex design problem that we are we are still struggling with. Um, PME will run by default on GPUs if you have one GPU and you choose a PME implementation with order four and no Leonard Jones PME and a few other minor restrictions, no, no free energy calculations. That's a big one actually. Um, it will run by default if it can. Um, if it can't run, the uh, log file will provide um, feedback on why it is not running um, so that you can consider whether that's that's an important part of, the, of your setup. Um, if there's multiple GPUs, then whether we automatically run PME on GPUs gets a little bit um, unclear. If you would like to force PME to run on a GPU, then you can do that. Um, historically, we had the um, minus NB command line option um, to say whether the non-bonded calculation should run on a CPU or GPU. Um, so that's still available. And to pair with that, we now have minus PME, which allows you to also to say that that must run on CPU or GPU. Um, if you want to run PME on GPUs, you have to run the, the short range non-bonded part uh, on GPUs as well. Um, so those are both available. Um, the if you're familiar with the GPU ID flag, that is, those details have changed a bit. I'm not going to go into that now because it, it's uh, very difficult to, to talk about without um, a lot of detailed things. Maybe we'll do a performance optimization webinar in, in a, a month or two. Um, but yeah, the, the nature of the information given by GPU ID has changed because we now have a more complex way of addressing work to the GPUs. Um, so do have a look at the documentation for both GPU ID and the new minus GPU tasks, uh, which allow you to fully specify all of these kinds of things. If you would want to have PME on GPU run on, say, a, a system that has four GPUs, the recommended way of doing that would be to set up um, four MPI ranks, for example, um, send three of the, have three of the works, three of the ranks do their particle-particle non-bonded work on, say, the first three GPUs, and have a separate PME rank, so you want to use minus NPME1, um, to then send the, the long range part of the PME work to the fourth GPU. That would be an example setup. Your mileage may vary. Um, you should certainly um, vary the, the different setup parameters to get best performance. Okay, well, thank Adam. you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Mohammed Assad. Uh, and uh, Mohammed, I'm going to open your uh, microphone in a second. Um, if you would like to uh, ask your question directly. Okay. Yeah, can you go, Mohammed? Ask your question. Okay, I can't hear uh, Mohammed's um, uh, question, so let me uh, let me just read it out. He uh, says, "Can you please elaborate on the physical validation test update in terms of pressure and temperature coupling?" So, does the physical validation test? Um, so the Thank you for your question, Mohammed. Um, there's not much in the testing suite that is particularly sensitive to temperature and pressure coupling. Um, if I might be permitted to read into your um, motivation, there has been a trend over time of comparing the quality of MD implementations by looking at their microcanonical ensemble, i.e. NVE, um, because that has a clearly conserved quantity. Um, and there, there certainly has been literature published about whether or not this is a good idea, and if so, how best to do such comparisons. Um, I won't go into that debate now. Um, but the, the physical validation tests um, are intended to allow you to run your simulation however you want to, and then look at the observable afterwards to see whether you got the things that ought to be expected given what you asked for. Um, so. Things like are the fluctuations of the conserved quantity, whether that is energy in an NVE or something else in a temperature or pressure coupled situ uh, simulation, um, whether the fluctuations in those quantities have the expected distribution that you you, you would expect from uh, the theory of uh, having a, a symplectic integrator that we have. Um, so there's not really a, a sensitivity to pressure and temperature coupling. What the implementation now gives you the ability to do is to run these kind of tests on the same setup. You don't have to 
think about, oh, well, I can test NVE, but then I need to do a temperature coupling on. What if there's a bug in temperature coupling? Well, no, you run your quality tests already on the same um, set of input parameters that you intend to, to run your production simulation on. Okay, and there was a follow-up question that said uh, that you mentioned also about the update for reporting conserved quantities, um, and uh, Mohammed want, uh, asked for a little bit more explanation about um, what that update provided. Okay, so if you look at the both the energy file and the log file uh, for um, simulation flavors that report a conserved quantity, um, in whichever version of Gromex you're looking at, um, then you will see that there is an energy field um, that reports, reports the, the conserved energy. If it's if you are doing a macro-canonical ensemble simulation, then the energy is the conserved quantity. Um, however, in if you're, for example, using the um, velocity rescaling um, Langevin-style thermostat, um, that has had a conserved quantity reported by Gromex in both leapfrog and velocity for some years. Um, the Nose Hoover thermostat, I think, has had that for some years. Um, and to that set of, and also the MTTK, ooh, I can't remember the names of all of the authors, so well, Martina, Tuck, Chapman, someone, anyway, MTTK is the, the acronym given to it, um, which is a, a very high quality um, pressure capping implementation. Unfortunately, it only works. Um, with a single MPI rank, so not very useful in Gromax at the moment. Um, we've got big plans to improve that. Um, so yeah, Burke in the latest 2018 release added to that set the ability to report the conserved quantity for Berenson style temperature coupling, Berenson style pressure coupling, and Paranolo Raman style pressure coupling, um, particularly with the leapfrog integrators. Um, so basically, we just expanded the set of integrators that already had a conserved quantity computed um, and able to be reported. So you can find in your log file, um, you will see um, that the, the energy section has an extra field if this is supported um, for the particular combination of algorithms you've chosen. If you find a combination that doesn't have one, please let us know on, on the mailing list or on askbioxl.eu, um, and we can let you know whether there's any plans to um, implement that or perhaps how to get what is already implemented available to you. Thank you, Mark. We have got a number of questions lined up, so I'm just going to uh, read them out rather than try to hand over the mic in the interest of saving time. Um, so the next question uh, is um, maybe may interesting in the work of some of the uh, some of the plans that we have lined up for BioXL. But the question is, I was wondering if Gromax 2018 can be interfaced with QM programs like Orca games for hybrid QMM calculation. If so, is there a particular program that works best with Gromax 2018? Uh, that's a good question for somebody other than me, actually. Um, it has been a bit of a problem for a long time uh, that um, we had a, an interface to a number of QM packages contributed to Gromax 4.0, 4 4.5, um, with the last time these were substantially actively maintained. Um, I don't have any direct experience. I, I can't give you a, a, an immediate answer to that question. Um, yeah. I suspect that Orca and Games are not well supported. Um, we did have some changes to Gromax 2018 that removed support for energy minimization and transition state optimization um, possibilities within Gromax. They were never intended um, to, to be used. Um, it was uh, one of the problems with um, integrating new features into Gromax is that as soon as you have feature A and someone adds feature B, um, people want the combination of A and B. Um, so that doesn't sound too bad when you have only two features, but when you have 40 features, uh, suddenly the matrix of does this support this combination gets very complicated. Um, so I can tell you that we we have exciting plans in, in the future for improving the, the support within Gromax, uh, some of it contingent upon um, BioXL's next round of funding, um, but we're going to look very carefully at, at um, having an implementation with CP2K and then making that work very well. So fingers crossed we, we get the funding for that. Um, the, for the moment there's no CP2K support, um, but please do fire a question particularly to the GMX users mailing list where Harold Grunhoff, um, who's our, our main QMM bureau, is likely to see your question um, and let you know what details he can 
um, provide there. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, the next question is from Mathieu, uh, and he asks, have you tried benchmarking um, the new professional GPU architecture of Volta? And uh, if yes, can you compare with the GTX 1080? Um, I don't have any numbers to hand. Um, Serrat has certainly done such comparisons, and yes, the, the, the Volta grade hardware run, runs very well. Um, it is considerably more expensive, so I, we would find it difficult to, to recommend for researchers pro procuring their own individual workstation or something. You don't need um, to, the, the value you get from the uh, additional features of the, the professional grade hardware is relatively low. Um, we strongly encourage you to get the, the high end um, Consumer grade hardware, the GTX 1080 Ti, um, will give you significantly better price performance. Um, however, if you already have a cluster that's been provisioned with the, the Volta grade GPUs, because, for example, they run simulations using other packages that need some of the features available there, including, for example, double precision uh, on the GPU, um, then by all means go and use it. It'll work really well. Um, go have fun with that. Okay. Um, so the next question, uh, Flora Tsurtu uh, was asking about um, double precision calculations through the use of CPU and GPU. Um, the concern, I think, is just whether you'll be able to maintain the precision by using by introducing the GPU into the, the calculations. Sure, we have long had two precision implementations within Gromax: so a fully double precision one and a mixed precision. Um, Different MD packages also have various forms of mixed precision. I don't think any two packages actually have the same implementations of mixed precision, so buyer beware there. Um, we do not have any support for GPU calculations running in double precision at this time, and we don't have any plans um, to implement that. Um, such implementations would make excellent use of, of the professional grade hardware um, that has long been available from NVIDIA. We haven't seen um, a convincing analysis that says the value to the user from the extra computational cost um, is worth us doing an uh, implementation that would run in double precision on the GPU. Um, we're certainly open to someone showing us the, that, that there is a relevant advantage uh, to be had, and we're looking actively for those kinds of advantages all the time. Um, but so far, we haven't seen it, so we prioritize the development resources um, such that no, you can't use double precision on GPU. However, there's a fully supported double precision implementation on the CPU. So if you would like, if you have a way to show that there is a simulation observable that is much better handled through running Gromex and double precision, we'll be all ears to hear about it. Um, and we'll consider that very carefully when we're making our future implementation decisions. Thank you, Mark. Um, so it's two minutes to the top of the hour. I'm going to combine the last two questions into one, uh, and then uh, I'll leave a minute at the end, or add on one minute at the end, for, uh, just to tell everyone about our upcoming webinars. So the, the last question that I'll take from the floor just now, um, the, the combined one, possibly from two different people. The first one is asking whether there are any uh, plans to create tutorials for the new Gromax features. And the second one is just a general comment about whether um, for a CPU, where the Gromax would generally prefer more cores or more gigahertz? Um, we will, we already have plans in place to, particularly for the new AWH feature, produce some new high quality tutorials. Um, we're very keen for people to try that feature out. Um, so Vivica Lindar will be, be working on that in future, uh, supported also by BioXL. Um, we sh also have some uh, other plans for updating our tutorial support. Um, over the coming months, now that we've gotten the, the release of 2018 out of the way and have stabilized the, the quality of it with the first patch release, um, yes, we should certainly um, do some more work on tutorials. We would love to hear from you uh, to find out which areas you find there are gaps that you would like to have covered by tutorials. Um, so please do send me an email, ask askask.bioxl.eu. Um, Ask on the Gromex users mailing list um, for gaps that you find. Maybe you'll find other users that'll say, oh, actually, there's this resource over here. Please please have a read of that. 
Um, there's lots of high quality um, tutorials and documentation out there. Um, some of it supported by the Gromex core team, some of it not. Um, please let us know what you would like to see and we can put that on our to-do list. Um, there was a partial follow-up, which does Gromex prefer more cores or more gigahertz? Um, that, I mean, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, uh, one of the issues is which particular kind of run setup you are running on um, and whether the CPU is one of those that is likely to dynamically change the, the, um, the speed of the CPU measured in gigahertz um, according to what the heat levels that have been previously output actually are. Um, more gigahertz is valuable if you're running a simulation that's strongly limited by the CPU, particularly during the update phase. Um, so that's that's valuable. Um, but yeah, as, as posed, the question doesn't have an answer that you can give. It, it all depends on your simulation, your hardware, and indeed how warm it is on the day. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for that. So um, I'm afraid we do have to bring the questions to uh, a close for today. Um, if you do have any other questions, do feel free to contact us, as Mark said, um, using Ask by our Excel. Um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the final slide now, uh, then I'll be able to um, uh, give people a quick heads up on the, the upcoming webinars that we have through by Excel. This, uh, we've got four in the pipeline at the moment. Uh, and, uh, on the 11th of April, um, we have a webinar entitled MC DNA, a web server for the detailed study of the structure and dynamics of DNA and chromatin fibers. Uh, and that um, is Jurgen Walter from IRB in Barcelona. Um, and then on the 18th of April, uh, a webinar that might be of particular interest to, to this audience, um, we have a perspective on the Martini force field um, from uh, Sievert Jan Marink from the University of Groningen. On the 26th of April, um, we have a presentation from Beaky Technologies uh, entitled Finding a Trade-Off Between Speed and Accuracy in Protein Ligand Binding Description. And then on the 10th of May, uh, we have a webinar entitled High Confidence Protein Ligand Complex Modeling by NMR Guided Docking Ensembles Early Hit Optimization. And that's Andrew Proudfoot from Novartis. So a varied set of webinars there over the coming weeks and months. Um, we hope you will be able to join us for, for some of them. Uh, and I hope that you found today's um, webinar useful. Um, so I think you should have also received uh, in your emails about this webinar, uh, a link that you can follow to provide feedback today. We'd appreciate that as well. Um, and in the meantime, uh, do keep in touch with BioXL. Thank you for coming along today. And we'll hopefully see you again soon at one of these next webinars. Thank you.